This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the introduction. Um, also, thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work that we're doing in the Gore Lab in terms of focusing on abiotic stress tolerance in crop plants. Um, and so today, I'll be talking about how we're using high throughput plant phenotyping to look at the genetic basis of heat and drought stress tolerance in cotton. And so just to give you a brief overview of how the talk is broken down, there's some background information because Outside of myself and probably Mike and a few others in our lab, I don't think many people in New York concern themselves with cotton generally. Um, then some basic plant breeding and remote sensing slides. These aren't to insult anybody's intelligence, just so they're all on the same page. And then we'll actually talk about the phenotyping experiment, including the platform itself, as well as the experimental design. And then finally, how we, you know, we process the data, the analysis that we do, and looking at those results. And then finally, the next step in terms of where we're going with this research and what else we have planned for the future. So although cotton is not a food crop, um, it single-handedly makes up one of the three basic requirements for life, which is you know, food, fiber, and shelter. And so no other food crop can lay claim to pretty much dominating one of the basic needs of life. And because of that, it is the number one fiber crop in the world. It's grown in over 100 countries. About 100 million families' incomes depend on this crop, so it has a fairly substantial economic impact globally. The top three producers are China, India, and the United States. China and India kind of battle back and forth right now in terms of who is the number one producer. You can see from the figures it's pretty close. Um, the United States is third. Um, so here at home, the U.S. crop is worth about $5 billion at a farm gate value. This translates into about $25 billion in terms of goods and services that's related to cotton production. There are two main species of cotton. There's upland cotton, and that constitutes about 95% of the acreage in production. Um, that is what most of us are wearing currently. And then the other variety is Pima, and this is more commonly called Egyptian cotton or Sea Island cotton. Um, in this bottom photo, you can see that upland's on the left. I don't know if it's come out that well on the screen, but it, Typically, upland cotton has a little bit wider fiber, where Pima cotton is a little bit more cream colored. What's interesting about cotton is that it really is a perennial tree that we cultivate as an annual row crop. And because of that, crop management is very crucial. And so the problems of G by E by you know, management become pretty central in terms of how the crop is produced. With that being said, um, the cotton fiber itself is pretty interesting, the fact that it's a single cell outgrowth from the surface of the seed. And so what happens is this you know, cell elongates for a while, and then after it reaches its defined length, it puts on cellulose, it essentially bulks up. At the end of the season, it dries down and it twists, and it forms this helical structure, which is what gives it its uh, mechanical properties. And the other thing that's interesting is that you know, the fiber itself is 100% pure cellulose. So like all production, or excuse me, all agricultural production, the increasingly variable weather patterns that we see and you know, the diminishing freshwater resources that we have occurring put a great strain on all agricultural systems and cotton is no less susceptible than anything else. Um, this picture just kind of epitomizes what the face of you know, the suffering looks like. This poor farmer has just lost his field. And as we look forward to the future though, where is cotton grown in the United States? So the cotton belt, expands from California up along the eastern seaboard. Um, those, that select region over here in California, there's seven counties that produce all the nation's Pima cotton. Uh, the rest of it is the majority of it is upland, and a lot of it comes from Texas, exclusively like the High Plains. But what's interesting is where cotton is produced historically has been threatened by drought. So here is the drought monitor map for 2011. Uh, this was a pretty severe drought for Texas. Um, it caused a $2.2 billion economic loss for the state. 55% uh, of the acres planted were just abandoned. And when we have these high incidences of drought, typically what's co-occurring at this time is high heat. And so, you know, everybody's aware that this pattern is, you know, pretty prevalent throughout the world. And so the global data supports the same pattern in China and in India in terms of cotton production. So the challenge becomes developing heat and drought stress tolerant varieties so that we can maintain sustainable production 
while hopefully you know, maximizing our use of the available water that we do have, as well as other natural resources. So plant breeding really offers the best solution. Despite what major seed companies might have you believe, there is no drought gene. Um, so a genetically modified approach typically is not going to work. And so plant breeding is you know, the genetic improvement of plants for human benefit. And the basics of it is we take two plants that we both have desirable features, we intermate them, we evaluate their progeny. From the progeny, we're trying to identify the line that has the most amount of favorable genes from each parent. And in order to do that evaluation, we use two sources of information. We use the genotype, which is its genetic makeup, and the phenotype. This is the actual physical appearance of the plant. This is typically what you eat, but in this case, it's going to be what you wear, so actual lint yield. In this image, you can see starting out with the wild cotton, um, there's not a lot of fiber, and the actual length of the fibers is not that long. Whereas now we move to cultivated cotton, substantially more fiber, and greatly increased fiber length. And so kind of like the tenet of plant breeding is the ability to connect genotype to phenotype. Given that if we understand the underlying genetics of a trait, we better understand the system, we can more effectively manipulate it to you know, our own will if you want, in this case, you know, producing more lint fiber. And you know, any way that we can understand the system, we can speed things up and develop cultivars more efficiently. Currently, right now, for most crops, it's about a 10-year cycle to go from a cross to releasing a commercial variety. So anything we can do to cut down on that time greatly helps us in terms of meeting climate change as well as production demands. And so kind of another basic of plant breeding is that it's a numbers game in terms of releasing new cultivars. Basically, you know, if you cross these parents, the more progeny that you can screen, the better, the higher success rate you have of identifying that one unique individual that carries the most amount of favorable genes from each parent. In terms of genetics and actual you know, studies of genetics, we want to work with larger populations because that increases our statistical power to basically dissect the genetic architecture. This means you know, find the genes, the causative elements that are giving rise to the phenotype. And thereby, you know, if we can understand those processes, hopefully we can improve our breeding methods. But given that, the next challenge is how do you, know, how do you manage collecting data on large uh, populations under actual field conditions? And so in the last 20 years, the bulk of the plant community's effort has been on developing genotyping sequencing technology. And so on the left, um, you see this top image is a ABI 377. 3,000 of these were running in tandem for over a year to sequence the human genome. That was in 1997. 17 years later, we have one machine, one day, one genome. So that gives you an idea of how fast technology improved. Unfortunately, for plant phenotyping, we have not seen that. In 1974, this gentleman is measuring a cactus with a steel tape measure. 40 years later, almost double, <laughs> the only thing that's improved is we use a barcoded measuring tape. And this kind of highlights you know, the problems of field phenotyping and why you know, this new development is needed in terms of technology to address these issues. So classic field phenotyping, it's time intensive. It just takes getting people out there to collect the data. And because of this, you get a limited amount of data collected um, that constrains your population size. It collect, influences how much data you can actually collect, so typically just like single time point. Also, there is the issue of quality in the public sector. Most of the data being collected in these large field trials is by undergraduates that have little to no investment in the project they're working on. So that's always an issue. Trait bias. Typically, you're out there, you want to score easily identifiable traits, like plant height, flowering date, things that don't take long for you to work with. You can just look at the actual plot and assess its score. And all these things give rise to the fact that classic field phenotyping is expensive. So what's coming up is this high throughput plant phenotyping, basically the combination of sensors and vehicles to collect data rapidly in the same experimental fields. This enables us to work with larger populations, like we already talked about, in terms of increasing statistical power. But more importantly, it provides us a longitudinal assessment of the phenotype. Instead of these single time point estimates, we actually get to see how the crop is developing along with the season. And this allows us to look at trait development versus the cumulative effects, like yield at the end of the season, you measure yield. And basically, you're capturing all the genetics that have taken place over the course of that plant's lifetime. Whereas if we can sample it at different points along the way, 
We can maybe you know, tease apart what's occurring at each stage. Also allows us to look at traits in relation to their environment. Plants are sessile organisms, so they can't get up and leave. They don't like the conditions. So this gives us a way to assess how they're interacting with their environment. And I would say it's lower cost because obviously there is some initial investment in terms of the sensor platforms and getting them to work. But once you have that up and running, it's fairly easy to go through and collect data. So kind of the fundamentals. Um, basically, we're relying on proximal sensing, which is an applied form of remote sensing. Basically, it's just we're taking these measurements in close proximity to the plant using cameras. Um, you've heard of multispectral, hyperspectral, regular RGB cameras. And basically, what we're trying to do is quantify the interaction of the le electromagnetic radiation with the plant canopy. And so on the right-hand side, you see a figure that I'm sure most of you are common or aware of. Basically, you know, the reflectance of the different wavelengths that a plant reflects back. And so it's this combination of non-contact measurements in vehicles that permit the rapid and frequent collection of data throughout the season. And so for most of us, you're probably aware of normalized different vegetation index. This is a classic, you know, high throughput phenotyping technique that's used. And so moving forward, here's the actual experiment that was conducted in Arizona. The goal of this was to understand the genetic basis of abiotic stress tolerance in cotton. Here is the current version of the phenotyping platform that's being used. You can see on the front is where you have your sensors arrayed. Um, it has now been outfitted with an AC unit, not for the driver. It actually puts uh, AC air out to the sensors to keep them cool. It now has an onboard small supercomputer for processing data. And so, but briefly before we start that, it's the idea of quantifying stress response. The sensors that we have don't measure the stress itself. It measures how the plant, plant responds. And so typically what we do is we work with multiple sensors that have overlap. And so we look at canopy traits like canopy temperature, which gives us an idea of plant water relations and NDVI. In this case, we're using it to quantify wilting or how the actual plant geometry is changing as the day progresses. Having overlap is critical because it's like when you go to the doctor, what's the first thing they do? They take your temperature. And all that tells you is whether or not you're sick. It doesn't tell you what you're suffering from, right? And so it's kind of the same thing where if we just collected NDVI and saw that, well, okay, the plant's wilting. Well, plants can wilt from drought stress, but they can also wilt from cold stress. So if you don't have the company you know, canopy temperature data, you can't really be certain what response you're measuring with these sensors. And so this is kind of the key thing, is about knowing what stresses are being applied to the plant and understanding what it is you're measuring in terms of a response. And so for our experiment, this was conducted in central Arizona, clear skies, very limited rainfall, extremely high temperatures. On the right, here's a graph of the daily highs and low temperatures with the red line at 32 degrees C. Temperatures above this sharply decrease lint yields. Of the 240 days shown up here, only 10 of those days did not exceed that threshold. So basically, it was pretty consistent high heat stress. We also used two irrigation treatments, a water limited and a well watered. Basically, these were a dry and a wet. The dry being, you know, water was replenished at 50% of the daily evapotranspiration rate versus 100%. This was administered using subsurface irrigation, so this gave us a really precise way to control how much water the plants are actually able to access. And finally, the stress was initiated at flowering. Um, imposing drought stress before flowering, typically the only thing you'll find out is that plants that flower early typically yield better. It's one of the main uh, drought avoidance mechanisms that all plants employ. And so basically, the take home is, is that this experimental design location provided us consistent heat and drought stress. And so we know why the plants were actually showing the symptoms and the signs and the suffering that they were. A little bit more about the experiment. Um, you can see in the photo here is the actual field itself, about 110 meters long. The circled, uh, I guess, the square around the plots, uh, these are the actual uh, field that we use. Um, it's 95 biparental upland cotton lines. And the canopy traits that we're measuring with our high throughput phenotyping platform are canopy temperature, height, NDVI, and leaf area index. Um, some of the physiological traits that we're also measuring is abscisic acid content and carbon isotope discrimination. These are two hallmark um, traits that are typically collected in terms of understanding uh, abiotic stress tolerance physiology. 
Additionally, we collected agronomic traits, including fiber quality, excuse me, uh, lint yield and bowl size, and then fiber quality traits like length, strength, and fineness. And then the additional set of data we collected was this actual ionomics panel. So here is the actual platform that was used to collect the data. Um, it's a high clearance tractor that's been retrofitted with these uh, set of sensors. And so the one that the majority of you may be common with is the crop circle. Um, it's an active multispectral crop canopy sensor. And so we had four of these arranged in a row. And basically each row underneath here is a unique genotype. Um, the other one we had was an IRT, an infrared thermometer, collecting our canopy temperature data. And then finally, a ultrasonic transducer, basically a sonar that's collecting plant height. And the key piece of equipment that really ties this together is having a GPS system that has a high level precision. So we use an RTK GPS. So your standard GPS has a precision of about three feet. And given that these rows are closer than three feet, it wouldn't allow us the resolution to actually tie back the data points to the specific genotypes. This RTK system gives you sub-centimeter level precision, and so that's what enables us to make sure that the data maps up to the right plants in the field. And then finally, there's data loggers to collect the data, put the timestamp on there, as well as geolo geolocation position points. And it is fairly fast. It could collect all the data on that boxed area um, within here. It could collect all these uh, readings in about 30 minutes. And so once we collect the data, it becomes a question of you know, the analysis pipeline of what do you actually do with it now? And so now I'll walk you through about how we took the raw data and actually did the genetic analysis. So here is the uh, geoprocess canopy temperature data. And blue indicates cooler canopy temperatures, green indicates warmer. So the well water versus the water limited, it's about a three to 10 degree difference. But the first thing that comes apparent is the resolution that we have. So each circle represents one data point. And within this, you can begin to see the variation between genotypes. Um, you can even start to see variation within the field itself. You'll notice down here on this east end of the field, uh, there's a little bit cooler canopy temperatures than the west end. And this is a dry treatment. And this is attributable to high clay content. Uh, clay holds onto water, obviously, better. And so the plants had a little bit more water to work with. Um, in terms of the actual data quality control, uh, it's a lengthy process, just like in any analysis. <laughs> this is where most of your time is spent. But the other thing is uh, dealing with these changing conditions as you're collecting the data. So on this image, this graph, you'll see from 7.30 to 8, just the ambient temperature increases 6 degrees in that half hour. If you don't correct for this, basically your canopy temperature data will tell you nothing. And so the method of how you deal with that, um, you know, we use analysis of covariance. We also use time as a random factor to see how they compared. Um, we treated time as a random factor. It did a good job of handling this, but it also handled sensor variation. The sensors do vary in terms of their temperature, and that affects their measurement accuracy. And then finally, you know, plotting some of the data to make sure that there's some issues that can always arise, like in this case, the sonar was miscalibrated and our plants were about a half a meter taller than they should have been. So it's just kind of these quality control issues that you need to go through. Um, so once we have that all processed, we move on to the actual, you know, we estimate the line values. So for canopy temperature here, the biggest thing you see obviously is the difference between the two treatments. It's about 10 degrees, but within that you see you know, in the water limited, you see there's a fair amount of variation in terms of the line values for canopy temperature. And so one of the basics of plant breeding is that you have to read two requirements. There has to be variation for the trait, and that variation has to be heritable. And what that means is that the variation you're seeing is controlled by actual genes and not just the environment. And so heritability is on a scale of zero to one. Um, zero means that the environment is driving all the variation that you're seeing. One means that it's all due to genetics. And so in this case, we have fairly high estimates of heritability, meaning you know, the genetics is controlling a canopy temperature trait. Um, given this, you can also see we have here are the parents of the population. 
And this is the idea of transgressive variation, the fact that, you know, the progeny, some of these lines do actually get more favorable genes from either parent, and therefore they outperform either parent. So this is what we're looking for in terms of developing new varieties, is um, varieties that have these, you know, canopy temperature properties in terms of being able to stay cooler. But what's really cool, and what really has not been done before, is measuring this in terms of time. And so here we have four time points across the day, 7, 10, 1, and 3 p.m. And we can see there's a range of responses in terms of the actual canopy traits. So down here for canopy temperature, excuse me, canopy height, it responds pretty much just like you would think. The plants don't get taller or shrink over the course of the day. Um, the difference you see is due to irrigation treatments, which makes sense that stressed plants just aren't as fit as, you know, the ones that have access to water. As we move up, we see that LAI has a slight decrease across the day as the plant begins to wilt. But finally, when we move up to NDVI and canopy temperature, you'll see that in NDVI, same things start out okay in the morning. They start to go downhill by about 10 o'clock, and then from 10 to 1 p.m., this is the peak heat stress of the day. This is when the plants are not happy, and you see the most amount of wilting occurring. And then by 1 p.m., the plants are kind of cooked, and they don't really recover until night. Canopy temperature, canopy temperature is the same story. Basically, it starts out from 7 a.m. There's a linear progression until 1 p.m. But the plants that have access to water, you know, don't suffer nearly as bad. And by 1 p.m., again, you're looking at about a 10 degree difference between the two treatments. And so this just shows us that the canopy temperature and NDVI are extremely responsive traits in terms of the soil moisture environment that they're in, as well as the actual air temperature. And so this is kind of what we're after in terms of, you know, when we do our genetic analysis, we're using these four time points to try and determine what genes are driving this response in terms of, you know, response to the environment as it progresses across the day. And so finally, you know, as we move forward, I just want to focus on canopy temperature here. So that was just over the course of one day. But do we see that same effect over the entire season? And sure enough, well, again, when we look at those same four time points um, across the top, and then on the bottom here is the actual canopy temperature values, and then the days of the season along the left-hand axis, we see that, sure enough, this dynamic response of cotton to you know, increased temperature in the irrigation regime is consistent. And I've listed the plant developmental stages on the left-hand side as well, basically to highlight that this response is consistent across you know, the plant's development which is good for us. Uh, moving forward, if we look at the actual canopy temperature measurements, uh, this is for 2011. Something that's kind of cool that came out of this was when we look within these developmental stages, we see that the correlation between the canopy temperature readings are more correlated with a growth stage than a crossed. And what this is suggesting to us is that these sensors are actually capturing some true biological signal, and more so it's telling us that you know, this response of canopy temperature is dynamic, and it's dynamic not only in the sense of across the day, across the season, but it even appears to be dynamic across the growth stages. But furthermore, what this really provides impetus for is that the fact that single point time, excuse me, single time point phenotyping just isn't going to cut it in terms of revealing what's happening in terms of the plant's life cycle. This would be akin to just taking a still snapshot versus you know, with HTP, we're using essentially a video to capture everything that's occurring across the season. And this is giving us a more detailed information in terms of how the plants are responding. And so when we actually do the genetic analysis, we use this technique called quantitative trait loci mapping. Um, I don't know if some of you may be familiar with it. Basically, we're taking two parents, we're crossing them. You'll see the two parents vary in their genotype. Their offspring has 50% contribution from each one. After things go through a round of recombination, uh, their chromosomes get broken up. And what we're doing is we're using the genetic markers to actually capture these recombination events. And this is what allows us to identify these genomic intervals that contain genes that could you know, be impacting the phenotype we're observing. So in this case, there's a QTL interval of you know, 20 centimorgans. And this could contain 200 or more genes. Um, but this is the basic technique that we're applying to our data. Moving forward, this is how it, the results panned out. In our study, 
I realize this graph is probably hard to read, especially because it's been reduced in size for the presentation. Um, on the top, we have the dry and the wet. You can see on the bottom is the wet treatment. On this right-hand axis, we have the three different years, 2010, 11, and 12. On the left-hand side are, again, the days within that season. And what we're trying to identify are, you know, QTL that impact canopy temperature. So if it's red, that means that it causes the canopy temperature to increase, whereas if it's blue, this QTL, this genomic interval, actually causes the canopy temperature to decrease. And so the interesting result for us was the fact that we were able to identify QTL that were expressed on a temporal basis. This kind of fits with what we would all expect, that you know, genes aren't turned on the whole time through the whole season, that there's this temporal component to it. And nobody had really ever shown this in terms of actually you know, field-based phenotyping. It's been done with growth chambers, but to actually see this result with field-based data is extremely exciting. But as we move forward, um, I think we all know we live in an age where generating data is easy, it's cheap, it's not really an issue at this point. Now the point is, you know, does this data actually mean anything? And so we took our canopy temperature results, and we also took the results from doing the QTL mapping for these other physiological traits like epicytic acid content and carbon isotope discrimination, and when we overlaid those results, they co-located the exact same region. And then luckily enough for me, I finished these analysis probably like in April, and about a week later, the cotton genome was published. And so I'd rather be lucky than good. And then so we took these QTL intervals and blasted them against the actual genome sequence. And we found these candidate genes. Um, so for, this was a QTL for carbon isotope discrimination. Um, there was only four genes in this interval, and one of them was this drought responsive family protein. And looking at the other literature, it fit quite nicely with the response we're seeing in terms of uh, water regulation. The other one, um, this QTL on this side, was identified for epicytic acid content. And again, when we did the blast search against the genome, the candidate gene that we identified was an ABA response binding element factor. And so this is exactly what we want to see because it lets us know that our fancy platform that's out there collecting all this data, it's actually collecting something real and that there's really, you know, genes driving the phenotype that we're seeing and that our platform is able to capture that. Um, no surprise that increased leaf transpiration contributes to, uh, you know, higher lint yield under drought stress. Um, and this is a repeatable pattern across the different years. Uh, these are just three time points from each respective year. It seems a fairly consistent pattern. Um, but just to note that you only see this response <laughs> if there's actually available soil water. If there's no water in the soil, the plants just can't do anything. But what's interesting is the distribution. So these lines out here, these are your water spenders, and these guys up here are your water savers. Basically, the idea is that some genotypes recognize that I will always have water, therefore I'm just going to keep transpiring no matter what the actual conditions are, whereas these guys up here they're a little bit more conservative. They're saying, no, I'm going to hang on to my water because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I don't want to burn through all of it and then not have any. And so the idea is, you know, do you breed for water use, water use efficiency or the idea of efficient use of water? And so that is just kind of a tool to help discern what it is you want to target. Obviously, C4 plants are different than C3 and how that impacts water use efficiency. And the other thing that was interesting was the relation between canopy temperature and lint yield. And we did the correlation analysis. We saw that canopy temperature was most correlated with yield during flowering. This isn't surprising. Um, flowering during cotton development is a uh, pretty critical time. High heat causes floral abnormalities, pollen sterility, floral abscission. And basically, if you don't have a flower, there's no way you can develop a cotton bowl. And there's no way you can generate any yield. Um, we saw the same thing for bowl size and canopy temperature, except that bowl size is most correlated during the middle of the season, which corresponds to development and fill. So using this type of information, we're hoping we can move forward and develop more predictive models of actual you know, yield using this type of data. Some continuing work that we have with the collaborators still there is using LIDAR imaging. So this is, uh, LIDAR is an instrument that basically emits a late, uh, light beam and measures the time it takes for that light to get reflected back. And so it basically creates like a 3D image. 
And so here is an image of one of those entire uh, blocks of our experiment. And so you can kind of begin to see the different rows within. But as we zoom in, here's a side profile of defoliated plants. And the key is that they have to be defoliated because the light can't go through the leaves. Um, you begin to see the basic structure of the cotton plants. And so these you know, clouds of points, this would actually be a cotton bowl. If we zoom in one more level, <coughs> you can actually see the actual individual plants. And what's really interesting to us is the fact that um, you can now map where these um, cotton bowls are at in terms of their location on the plant, as well as get some type of estimate of their size. And so this is the type of you know, technology we're moving forward to to better understand um, cotton's response to heat and drought stress, and undoubtedly other crops as well. So just kind of a summary on this part of the experiment. Um, basically, it was the development and deployment of this uh, high throughput phenotyping platform. And the ability to collect data throughout the season on multiple times during the day gave us a way to study and quantify dynamic responses of these traits under contrasting irrigation regime, regimes, and basically allowing us to connect the physiology and plant development to the genetics that we're really targeting. And the most exciting thing was this identification of temporally expressed QTL patterns in terms of seeing that, yes, QTL, you know, they're not on all the time. They respond to their environment as well as the plant developmental stage. So in terms of our next steps, about where we go from here in working with abiotic stress tolerance, is kind of understanding this equation. Um, phenotype is a component of genotype, environment, and their interaction. So at this point, we're really good at getting the genotype data. We're improving on getting the phenotype data, but it's kind of understanding the idea of how genotypes interact with their environment. And so in terms of quantifying the environment, you know, atmospheric conditions, we're pretty good at collecting weather data. Soil conditions. Um, in the plant breeding world, we really don't incorporate these much into what we do. And so looking going forward in terms of understanding genotype by environment interaction, what we typically do now is we grow these lines out at numerous locations and essentially estimate a deviation from an overall mean. It's not a very precise method. And so our current phenotyping technology really only tells half the story because we only can phenotype the top half of the plant, right? Everything that's below ground, we can't see. In-field root phenotyping is just in its infancy, and there's really no viable technology out there to get that kind of information. And so the question is, we want to know is, you know, how do plants interact with their soil environment since this is kind of you know, where they extract their nutrients, where they're getting their water from. So it's a very key component. And basically, if we can understand these G by E components, we can capitalize on its effect. Because genotype by environment interaction is not a you know, linear response. It's more of a multiplicative, where you can get greater increases in yields if we can capitalize on specific environments. And so to do that, the challenge becomes developing these predictive models of plant performance. And so one approach that we're taking to this is using ionomics. Uh, basically, every component of the cell contains elements. And these elements are involved from everything from electrochemical balance, uh, you know, water regulation, osmo osmoregulation, biochemical reactions, structural components. Um, they form complex interactions. There's all, all sorts of you know, overlap between the different networks in terms of ion transporters that can transport both types of ions, but those ions are selectively transported based on local pH. And so what's exciting for us, though, is that the change in elemental composition can be influenced by, in this case, abiotic stress or drought, soil composition, plant morphology, as well as developmental stage of the plant. And so what we're hoping to do is kind of capitalize on this abiotic stress and down here at the bottom is a table of periodic elements. And those ones in the gold boxes are the essential elements for plant growth. These are the ones that we are collecting data on in our ionomics panel. The purple ones are non-essential trace elements, but they do give us an idea of what's occurring in the actual soil environment. And so here's just a brief rundown of the pipeline. Basically, the plants are grown in the field. We get the mature seeds. They're put in you know, these plastic 48-wall trays. There's this robot that puts them into these uh, test tubes. They're dissolved in acid. They go through what looks like an incubation step. Then you have your technician 
Greg Ziegler, bless his heart, he fights them out and then he runs them for you on the ICPMS, which is an ion coupled uh, plasma mass spectrometer. And so what we're hoping to get to is understanding the physiology as it relates to genotype by environment interactions. And we're using seed ionomics to do this. And so, you know, the question is, is how does cotton change its, you know, uptake of elements um, from the soil in response to abiotic stress? And this could really help us, you know, understand the environmental impacts of physiology. Um, and also maybe potentially provide us with some type of predictive tool to understand which of those genotypes um, are better able to cope with stress. And so in these biplots of the elements down here, you can see that strontium and calcium don't really change from the well-watered to the water-limited treatments. But if you look at cadmium, it changes quite a bit in relation to the other elements. So this would be something we'd be looking for in terms of maybe some type of, if you, if you will, like a biomarker to indicate you know, abiotic stress tolerance, how plant you could use cadmium in order to cope with heat and drought. Extending this work a little bit further, um, this is a variogram of the calcium ions in the seed after correcting for the different irrigation treatment effects as well as spatial effects of the field. And you can see on this east end of the field, again, you have these high residuals. And so the idea is, you know, we could use statistics, we can fit polynomials, we can handle this in a statistical way, but perhaps we should think about it by incorporating information about the actual environment that's occurring where these plants are being grown. And so on the left, we have these EM38 readings, um, basically giving us an idea of the soil texture. And basically, we see down here, you know, this area of the field has a high clay content. Um, and so, and then if we look on this one, this is the actual creating of calcium content at a depth of 60 centimeters. And let me back up, I apologize. Um, we also collected ionomics data on the soil itself, not just the seeds. And the depths are, there's five depths ranging up to 120 centimeters. And so that's kind of the data we're using to model the calcium content within the field. And so we can see the type of spatial variability um, with respect to calcium. And so what we're trying to do as we move forward is incorporate these environmental parameters into our models in terms of understanding how cotton, or quite frankly, any plant for that matter, is you know, using its environment to deal with heat and drought and how these, all these components fit together instead of just treating the environment as maybe you know, in a statistical method. And so moving forward, it's kind of this idea of integration of information. Um, crop growth is not an additive process, but all of our models treat it that way. And so really what we're trying to move forward to is you know, utilizing crop growth models because they represent a functional relationship between plant physiology and the environment and how that actually impacts the overall phenotype. And so currently, we're really good at these two aspects um, in terms of quantifying the environment and seeing the actual final phenotype at the end. But what happens in between, we're not so good at. And so one way that we could address this is with high throughput phenotyping is we can actually estimate these growth parameters like radiation use efficiency, leaf initiation rate, as well as leaf appearance rate. And what we would like to move forward to is actually using these crop growth models to extract the parameters, these growth parameters, and use those as the new phenotypes. They have some interesting properties. They show less genotype by environment interaction. They typically have higher heritabilities than the traits being measured themselves. So from an analysis standpoint, they have some desirable features. But basically, we'd like to move forward in terms of developing these genotypic growth curves. This would permit QTL mapping on a continuous basis. So, you know, the data we have, we just had these select time points along the curve where now we can fill in the entirety of it and use that type of information for doing the QTL mapping to identify the genes that are driving the phenotypes. Um, and ultimately, moving forward to incorporating all this information to understand how the components relate. So down here we have our environment in terms of precipitation. In most growing regions in North America, it's wetter in the beginning of the season and then gets drier at the end. Well, as well as temperature, it stays cooler, then peaks in the middle of the summer, and then tapers off. And what we're trying to do, you know, is understand QTL expression, whether that QTL expression is favorable, increases, or decreases. And basically what we're trying to do is connect all this together in relation and develop these genotype growth curves 
And if we can do this, and we can understand the temporal patterns of gene expression in relation to their environment, we have a chance to really optimize genotypes for even seasonal precipitation patterns, peak heat stress, and maturation time. And so, pull, oh, um, yeah. And so that's kind of where we're moving forward to. Um, so just some overall conclusions that high throughput phenotyping will undoubtedly you know, change the way we breed plants. Um, it's a very valuable tool in terms of letting, uh, letting us look at plant development and trait expression in, in a new way. And, but more or less, it allows us to peek into like, this idea of not just a static time point of just you know, taking these snapshots, but we actually get to see the trait develop, how the plant responds to the environment, and how the actual phenotype is formed. Um, something that's not really been done before. And so if we can successfully you know, integrate all this information, hopefully we'll help you know, breeding for precise environments. You know, at the bottom line, we're trying to optimize varieties to help farmers, because farming is an extremely risky business. Since most of us are in this room, I don't think we make our income on it. Um, it's very, you know, the profit margins are thin, and anything we can do to help, I think, is worthwhile. And I think this offers a very sustainable solution. And finally, you know, addressing the issues of climate change and how our plants are able to cope with that stress. Um, in terms of people, I mean, there's always a ton of people to thank on a project of this size. So Mike, the Gore Lab members, Tim, um, all the people at USDA ARS where this experiment was conducted, um, is including what University of Arizona, as well as New Mexico State and University of Illinois. And with that, I would thank you for your time and attention and welcome any questions. So this is just a biplot in terms of how the traits are related in terms of their variance. So the angle between them is how their correlation value and the length of the vector is how much variation there is. So I can't really tell you in terms of how that changes. I can only tell you how it changed relative to the other um, elements being analyzed. I haven't seen any type of IR sensors that would correlate with the ionomics data, but in terms of what you're saying, you know, incorporating that time element, I mean, we can do the ionomics on leaf samples. I think, I don't want to speak out of turn here, Mike, but I think one of the reasons we did it on a seed is for cost reasons. Because um, if we were to do it across the entire season or, you know, regular intervals, I don't know how much that would cost. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it would be ideal to find something, you know, some type of camera that could tell us the same information as doing the actual ionomic analysis. Um, basically, we do an extensive outlier remover, removal process. Because we're collecting so much data, like you said, not all of it's good. And so what we do is we fit like a linear mixed model. We use student diet deleted residuals to remove those data points that are obviously flawed. I mean, like with NDVI, if you get anything below 0.3, automatically you're thinking that's ground. So those get thrown out. With a canopy temperature, I mean, you would see values of like 60 degrees C. And so you're like, well, that's obviously not the plant, because it would literally be on fire probably. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but no, you're, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, because you have to get rid of that data. It's plus, not all good. Plus we were on one of the um, it's one of the things. So the groups in Australia, the one of the things they look at is actual root angle. Because unbeknownst to me, sorghum is really good at stealing water from its neighbors. And at first it goes lateral and then it goes down. And so that's kind of the same type of question, you know, um, how, does, how does the genotype, what's the response that it's using to do that? And so like you're suggesting, yeah, I mean, if we could figure out the actual growth parameter, that would give us an idea of how it's accessing its water and its nutrients. And again, like if we can combine that type of information with the soil profile, that gives us a better idea. All right, with that, I thank you for your time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.